a photo from the Forbes article of Ye in the middle of the big circle. We're constantly creating. He's got a really cool sense of what should be next and what is the future. We're very in sync with each other in the creation process. I have 3,500 complete designs I've done for him with five new styles a year. Foam Runner and the Slide are our two most affordable products we've made. I've always had this open mind. If you're going to make it better, you need to understand it, what's happening to it. If you don't try, then you never know. And then you've already failed because you didn't try it. I say late afternoon sweet treat and some coffee. <laughs> How's your week been? I know you've been traveling. Where did you just come back from? Was it Italy you said? Yeah, we were there for a couple days. That's so cool. And I think you were at the beginning of last week you were racing. Yeah, and then my I trashed my motor. <laughs> How often do you go racing? Um, three to five times a year, depending on, um, if I s stay in state or if I go to go race in, in Laguna Seca in Northern Cal, which I, I like the track a lot, but it depends on if they, uh, if the race has a group from my car, sometimes they don't have a, a group for small sedans as far as the 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 groups because they have like you know muscle cars formula cars um can am cars trans am cars and they don't have a small group small car group there's no there's nobody for me to race with so and it's not like i'm you know people always ask do you win i'm like of course not i race a volkswagen beetle you know <laughs> it's like um but the car is fun because it's a historic car. That's all it's ever been is this race car since the day the first guy bought it in 1965. So I'm doing with it what it was meant to do. That is so cool, Stephen. Stephen, whereabouts are you currently based? Is it Los Angeles? No, I live in um, Lake Oswego, Oregon, kind of south of Portland. Um it's a it's a rather it's a rather nice little city god how's the weather there now is it starting to cool off or is it still pretty warm it's uh 87 and sunny today oh nice i don't know what that is in celsius but it seems warm <laughs> let's look um yeah it's kind of warm it's it's been it's we've had a really nice summer you know, because it it can uh, it it can um, be crappy here <laughs> if you're uh, if you don't like the rain and the gray. Thirty thirty degrees Celsius. Oh wow, that is warm. That's really nice. You know, the one thing that's nice about the Pacific Northwest is you don't get the humidity like you get on the East Coast or say like when I would go to. Uh, japan and korea to be really humid in the summer here it's very it's it's a, a comfortable a comfortable heat which you know when it comes to the racing it it makes racing interesting because you're in your you know we wear the same gear as a f1 driver or a nascar driver so you have the full layer of um, fireproof underwear head to toe and then two layers on of the suit so it's three layers of nomex that you have on um and it can get really hot oh, especially fast. when you're sitting out on the tarmac <laughs> how fast can you go in the old beetles when you're racing um this one i was just you know previously racing up in seattle where there's a longer straightaway i mean it'll do 120 miles an hour whoa I was not expecting that. Wow. Yeah, it's had a lot of tricks done to it. Uh, custom transmission. So it's geared, you know, it's geared for higher speeds. Um, and uh, yeah, it's fun. It's a little scary driving an old Volkswagen Beetle that fast, but it's part of, part of the fun of it. How does it handle? Is it like shaky when it's gone that fast? Yeah, once you get above 90 miles an hour, it starts vibrating a lot, you know, and the window starts pulsing and, um, but it's pretty good. You know, these, these guys set it up right in the sixties when they built the car originally. Um, and we just put on 
uh, new new shocks and uh, adjusted the suspension a little bit. But other than that, we we leave it set up pretty much how they did. And because of the vintage class I'm in, you have to run vintage style bias ply tires, no radials. Um, so you're racing it fairly period correct. Um, so it, it, it does all right. You know, it's, it's, it's no Porsche. <laughs> Steven, do you sort of work from home? Like, like we've been sort of texting over the last one or two weeks and you're sort of like, you know, you're racing, you're flying. Do you go into the office? Like what's your sort of weekly schedule like? Uh, with yay, I don't know if, you know, sometimes we have an office, sometimes we don't. Um, we've had some really nice offices, uh, as, but you know, he would move from California to Chicago, then would work out a temporary space in Chicago, then would go back to California. Then he went to Atlanta, then he went back to California. Then we went to Wyoming. We had actually kind of a cool office there. Um, and we worked out of his ranch for a while, which was really cool. And then we ended up back in California again, uh, post COVID and it's kind of, it's very funny. It's very different for, for people to understand, um, other than having some like a prototyping area, which we, we have, there's no proper office. Like you understand it. I have people always ask, you know, oh, you have, you know, you have this job as this executive of design and what's your office like you know because when i was at nike it was like each level whatever you got on the ladder you got a bigger office and then a conference room on your office and an even bigger office and, and it's like my backpack is my office everything i need is in it so when it, when it comes to like prototyping and things like that i have a uh, i have a lot of the machines that i need here at home and uh i can make mostly anything prototype wise here and then you know, down in down in California, we have a little bit more of of uh, traditional footwear factory machines and some uh, apparel equipment and things to to whip up whatever whatever we're dreaming up. So it's it's a, it's a non traditional office environment. What have you been prototyping and building as of late? Um, I, I did some really interesting apparel solutions. Uh, different ideas on constructions, usually things like that. And the footwear, um, we, we've all been kind of mocking up some of the, the future of what, what the shoes will be. Some of the things he's been spotted wearing, things like that. How do you make like a shoe from scratch? Like, isn't it like I've been watching these people who create these custom shoes but then they tear apart a bunch of existing shoes and they stitch it all together and they create this cool unique looking shoe but you guys are creating shoes from scratch like how do you create a shoe from scratch and prototype that from your home you just have a vision and then figure out the best ways you can do it you know find some of the materials mock up with some different materials i mean part of that improv from nothing gets you to a new place a lot of the times and it also uh, it kind of kind of forces you to think different, uh, minimalist as well as um, simplifying the construction, which at the end of the day is a good you know it's a good thing, um, methodology wise, and and thought process wise you know and and if I need to go further I'll go find somebody who can do a step or two or something that I need. I mean when 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 we had our shop in California there's still there's still pretty much anything um anything i need if i need it done i'll send it down to one of my helpers and they'll make it for me and send it back up to me or i'll take a trip down and go fabricate it fabricate it down there if need be it's all very fluid you know it's not like i said it's not the traditional you know you go over to beaverton inside the berm at nike everything's there for you you know it keeps it challenging and interesting you know it puts you i i i equate it sometimes to being dropped on a desert island and you have to figure out how to survive <laughs> and so that's what you do you figure out how to make the stuff um and yeah my my part of my background was uh fabricating and making things and that's uh, 
the old the old old guard at New Balance when I started as a 21, 22 year old kid, they taught me shoemaking. So I, you know, I make my own patterns, I sew all my own things, uh, glue all the components together. Whatever needs to be done, I'll do it as best I can. Steve, when you're like creating like for example the Yeezy slides or even the sole of a shoe and there's like a certain shape and design, how do you sort of make that at home? Like does it get 3D printed? Do you build a mold and then put sort of material into the mold? How do you create that from scratch? Um, sometimes I'll just mock it up out of foam with like a, a Dremel and some power tools. Um, sometimes we'll, I'll, I'll make a mold at home if I need to. Uh, I was just shopping for mold making supplies before I logged on. And sometimes we'll, we'll, you know, we have we have facilities to 3D print things, so we'll get a rough 3D print going of things like the foam runner, for example, that that had the rough shape, but it wasn't finalized and right down to yay sitting there with a piece of sandpaper getting the exact shape he wanted on it, which was, yeah, it was kind of fun to watch that uh, and be part of that. It's like, I want this shape like this. I want this more of this curve, more of this curve, like what curve? And he's like, you do it so he sat there with the sandpaper and shaped the final form it was kind of fun with it's these... not the type of thing you would see in the traditional corporate world <laughs> most definitely with the constant copying of designs are you guys constantly just chasing and running and sprinting to stay ahead and the moment you come up with something innovative it gets copy and then now you're still running to sort of kick like is it this constant race and sprint that never stops um we're constantly creating and each step as you can see from the the photo from the forbes article of yay in the middle of the big circle each steps get gets you to a new place or something different so we're constantly creating constantly mocking up constantly 3d printing um to stay it to stay ahead of the curve and I, I think a lot of the times he's got a really cool sense of what should be next and what is the future he and i have had some good conversations about creating the future that we want as opposed to letting other people create the future they want for us and so that's kind of what the approach we take like well why is it this way and it's you know it's that's what's been fun with me having spent a lot of time in the corporate world and being very miserable within the corporate environment of everything pre-programmed formulaic and recipied was hey what about this I'm like sure let's try it what have you got to lose you know if you don't if you don't try it you've already failed so why not make an attempt at success and out of it come these cool quantum leaps and and aesthetics and construction that we've been known for within within the easy brand Stephen, how does yay sort of have that eye for design and have that sort of eye to see into the future and, and stay ahead where do you think he gets that from is it something that do you think he was just born with and it's innate does he read a lot does he learn a lot does he spend time with a lot of designers yeah i mean some of it's all of us working together in a collective you know to come up with a with multiple visions or a common vision that gets us to where we need to go you know he'll show me a picture of something and then i'll show him a picture of something and I'll sketch it. Oh yeah, that's cool. That's fire. That's really, it's from the future. All right, let's go. And we build it. And you know, it's, it's, um, we're very in, in, in sync with each other in the creation process. So it's almost like being on the same page a lot of the times, but we push each other, you know, he'll, he'll push me with something and then I'll push him with a, with a vision of something else. And out of it will come to this new place of, of things. I mean, at the end of the day, you're still making something to, it's a device of movement and protection. And those are kind of the key things you're always after. And how can you make it interesting? How can you make it out of a new material? Our eyes are always open looking for, looking for things. You might see a, a new piece of material on something else and go, well, this could be really cool. That could lead to a new application of something. And out of it comes this thing you've never seen before. And that's what's that's what's refreshing about it is the risk taking. How many percent of sort of prototypes you make, let's say you put together like a hundred different designs, sketches, prototypes, would one, 10, how many of them would actually make it to mass production? 
Oh, you know, in in my iPad alone, I have 3,500 complete designs I've done for him. And then we kind of just as a practice came out with five new styles a year. So there's lots of iterating, lots of designing, lots of process. But it's interesting what we're creating a lot of the times is a, is a catalog to choose from. You know, one thing might have had, oh, that's a cool um, way to treat the collar. That's a cool way to do the outsole. And then we revisit them and mix them up and create something new from all of it. Lots of references. Stephen, what's your thoughts on color? Like one thing that really stood out is like over the last five to 10 years, Kanye has built a very specific sort of color palette, like all the beige or the sort of gray tones. He's really brought that to the culture. And, and, you know, sometimes I'm like putting together a logo and I'm opening the color wheel and I'm like, there's like an infinite amount of colors and you could, there's probably a bunch of colors that haven't been unlocked or really utilized. And you could just go through and try every single color for like ever. Yeah, I mean, we we definitely do a lot of mock-ups in, in different colors, but part of it is the intent, the original intent of the sketch, um, like the Wave Runner, for example, that was the colors that it was sketched in and that's the way it came out. Sometimes the shoes are released in, in different different colors than how we created them um like the orange boot for example uh which is still yet to be to be released part of that was influenced by um we were in wyoming and we did a lot with safety equipment and then also in in chicago there's the photo that uh was taken of him on the L track with the safety vest on with the first debut of the quantum sample standing up on the L column. And it was in safety gear because when we got to Chicago, we were exploring what other, what other garments were being built there. And that's the cool thing is you go there with an open mind and just explore what's happening in Chicago. Who's making apparel? Uh, who's making footwear? Where can we go? And we found a lot of safety equipment. So then that influenced the aesthetic and the colorways. So there were a lot of safety colorways, you know, like the um, the bright yellows in the 350s uh, were from like safety vests, silvers uh, from reflective from street workers. So it it, it depends, you know, and, and a lot of the, the earth, earth tones are something that he's always been interested in. So it's twists, twists on the earth tones, flesh colors, natural things. That's what's <laughs> cool. That's what's cool about it. And you know, when he first had me working on the Wave Runner, you know, there's like 10 different colors in that thing. I'm like, what are we doing? And then when you see it all done and it's resolved, it's it's really interesting because that shoe almost hooks up with anything right down to the little, you know, it's 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 neutrals and blues, there's blacks, there's the little two hits of orange and the ellipses and the heel and it'll it'll go with anything. That's what's so neat about it. And I think that's that's a lot of what just naturally happens the way we create the product from the the design the patterning and right down to the the color choices is that they become fairly universal um you're not thinking about it but it just naturally happens i guess Stephen, what's your thoughts on like going all the way back and sort of studying like tribal clothing and tribal shoes and what people used to wear in the medieval ages what people wore back in the days where people would hunt is that something you you look back at yeah i mean we we did some shoes inspired by that some mock-ups uh like that there's there's been a foam runner prototype photo from the next generation that's kind of popped up that was influenced by some medieval knitted shoes um there were it was cool when we were doing the domes when he had built the domes in Calabasas, there was a first we built the dome and the intent was to make it like housing, but then it became a universal space. He cut a hole in the floor and we put in a fire pit. So you think of like primitive times, caveman, you've got the fire pit inside your cave that brings you the warmth and the light and the dark, and then transformed into a cooking stone. We put a black slate round cooking stone on it and then he had these two armenian chefs they would come and then cook us every dinner every night on this on this cooking stone in the fire pit in the middle of the dome it was cool you know it just kept evolving and a lot of that is very minimalist and primitive you know fire food and just cooking on the open fire inside this uh 
minimalist dome. And I usually, I, I like the vibe of the dome. I would go out in there and with my iPad and sketch in, inside there because it's very, it's very relaxing and very, uh, you could stay very focused. It was spiritual to be in it. And being in Southern California, you know, it, it stayed like an even 74 degrees in there and night and day. It was actually, it was actually a really cool space. What's Yay's sort of circle like? Does he have someone like you when it comes to shoes, someone else when it comes to clothing, someone else when it comes to architecture? And there's this sort of small group of sort of designers in different sort of aspects of life. Yeah, I think it, it it crosses over multiple. Some of us actually, some of us actually work work on it together. We cross over. You know, one of the architects might have an interesting shape or form, and then can translate that into a piece of footwear or a garment. Some of the garment materials might inform what you're doing for finish treatment with inside the domiciles. So it all kind of cross references. I, I always equate it to he. Ha- there's a group of us that are the band, and then occasionally you cycle through session musicians like you need a violin player but you're not gonna have violin on every song so you go get the violin player for the one song but you get the best violin player in the world to help you out with to cut the track so i I, I think we we look at the a lot of the design in, in a similar fashion to that you know we're the core band you know you got your drums a bass player vocalist and keyboardist and then you know, like I said, you need you need a violin player, so you get that. You get a saxophone player, so you get the best sax player in the world, and they cut some tracks with you. So it's 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 really interesting. And we're you know when when um, when he's creating the music, sometimes he'll ask me to just come hang in the studio and just catch the vibe of what's going on with the music, and that can then uh, influence me spiritually and what we're doing on the design side of things too, the flow and the feel and and the vibe of where it's at, which is, it's really refreshing. It's very different than sitting in your cubicle, creating the next $70 shoe that'll sell 200,000 pairs, you know, and taking $2 out of the FOB. (laughs) What does FOB stand for? Freight on board. So it's kind of the final, it's your final cost versus the consumer. So that's, that's the delivered, like, the company price of what they pay is FOB. And then there's markup, whether it's the retailer markup or your profit markup and all of those things are added in between. Got it. Within the core band, how many members do you think they are and what are the roles or expertise? Um, You kind of hit on most of them. I mean, other than adding in music, there's a few people who come and go. Over the years, there's there's a a few people who have come and gone and then come back again. But I mean, there's usually three or four of us that are the core, that are constants. How has working with Donda differentiated with all these corporate companies where you're calculating the FOB and they're trying to get you to reduce it by $2? When you're working with Ye and designing shoes, does that come into the picture? And if it doesn't, does it make it hard to scale and mass produce and create something that's commercially viable? Um. We've always looked at it like create the best thing possible in the vision and then he'll set the price. And that's kind of what we do. Never talk about margin, none of that. I mean, it's refreshing because it can be so constraining on creativity. It's much better to create. I mean, you, you look at it where, I don't know, you think of like the first television, right? It was the one. And then I'm sure it was outrageously expensive. But then everybody had to have it. So then you figure out how to make it more affordable. But you create the object of desire, the the initial product art piece, and then go from there. And the you know if you're on the right track, which seems like we magically have been with everything we've done, the the profit follows. You know it'll it'll just happen. And we're not profit driven. It's we're we're creation driven, and that's very different than within the corporate world. How does Ye and Donda stay afloat? Like, especially now that you guys are sort of independent, like, how do you guys survive? There's various other revenue streams that that pop into it. You know, music's part of it. It's just different. You figure out a different way to, to operate and do business. And he's, you know, he's he's had great resources to to get after things. And he wants to explore everything and make the world better. 
have you guys done a drop since you guys gone independent and do you guys plan to go like direct to consumer do it just through e-commerce or what sort of the vision going forward i mean there's been if you look at what we did it was traditionally e-commerce and if you you know if if, if essentially whoever was running easy.com at the time it's essentially direct to consumer through easy.com so it's already the model we've operated under and occasionally something would trickle out into a brick and mortar retailer he wants to do that himself um have our own stores uh so we'll see what the future holds you never know it can change how do you guys because i know yay has a vision of creating you know ten dollar shirts creating sort of affordable clothing where everyone could look fresh at an affordable price. How do you guys balance that aspect where you're just sort of scaling and sort of mass producing items against the innovating and creating a bunch of one-offs and being the first TV and it's high price? Like, how do you guys balance both ends of the spectrum? It's it's challenging at times. I mean, the, the $10 is a great goal um, and creating democratic product is a great goal but you see it's always a balance between ability to produce profitability and um, desirability so if you look so foam runner and the slide are our two most affordable products we've made and the desirability is still there because they in the resale market the slides you know, they were like 60 bucks resale. They're like upwards of 250 sometimes, which is wild because it means we could ask 200 for the slides, you know, but we don't. And the foam runner was kind of the first easy shoe under a hundred dollars. And that's what was really cool about that. But I mean, even those are, they resell for multiple hundreds of dollars. So there's, there's definitely a ceiling for, you know, we, we've, there, there's a much higher ceiling for the, for the prices of what we can ask for some of the product it's just we don't and it was really cool because the foam runner in particular that was made in the usa for under a hundred dollars pretty groundbreaking at the time because i mean even crocs are made in asia now you know nothing nothing's made in the u.s uh, and that's purely for profitability we did it for people to have jobs in america which was kind of you know very different to hear the footwear business want to do that and yeah, it was a challenge to get Adidas to think different about it too, because they would um, immediately want to default to the profiteering. And it's like, no, 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 no. This is about people. Who manufactured the foam runners and Yeezy slides? Like that American sort of warehouse or manufacturer, did they already produce shoes in America or did you guys have to restart something up? They were already making their own in-house brand. And uh, we we uh, approached them to to do ours, and so that's kind of where it came from. And then Adidas ultimately went and split production anyway back into China, which we weren't happy about. But what can you do about it, you know? But we we succeeded in what we wanted to do, which was show that you could make product in the U.S. It's how you think about it differently. And Stephen, with the foam runners and the Yeezy slides, what's your thoughts on like supply, demand, sort of resale price? Like, are you guys going to make more foam runners? And if you do, will it be the same color? Or will it be different? Are all these one-time limited drops? What's your whole thoughts on sort of that? Only he knows. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm sure Adidas will keep trying to drop some colorways because they you know, they, they have all the production equipment for it. So, um, but they still need his permission to sell it. When it comes to design, is there any IP or any, is there anything you could do to keep something that you've made yours? Because there's so many similar things being made. And when someone makes a similar thing, can you sue them? Like, can you really own something that you make and, and create? I think the business has gotten to the point where it's very difficult to control it. Um, part of it was the manufacturing in the USA because we were able to keep it on the down low and in the dark about what we were doing. And it is once it 
you know, once Adidas split the production into China, that it was then opened up to vulnerability and copying. And I think it's just what you what you accept uh, is part of the business, whether you like it or not, that things will be copied, riffed off of, uh, replicated, um, pirated. So, and I think part of his mentality towards it is we're, we're already into the next phase of the future, whatever, you know, we're, we're, it's the past already. We're creating the next, which I think is, you know, that's in some ways it's kind of refreshing, but it is missed opportunities to, to make some extra money. And if the demand is there for somebody to pirate it, then we're doing something right, you know, <laughs> but we could make, you know, it, it's obvious we could make more money if we continue to make more of our own uh, and protect it a little better. But, you know, that's the nature of where we are in the world right now. What's given that mentality? Are you constantly just creating new designs, looking at, like, are you just constantly looking for that next thing all the time? given that every time you make something, it's going to be copied, it's going to be replicated. So all you can do is just go to the next and move forward. Yeah, stay stay a moving target and you'll survive versus being sedentary and sit there. I mean, if you look at some of the brands that didn't move, like Crocs in its old days, they didn't change too much and they kind of, you, you kind of cap out. Everybody has them. Um, Tom's. Same kind of thing. Everybody had them. The consumers that wanted them got them, and then your business died. So you you have to be careful about that. And I mean, that's part of being a creative is constantly creating. It's not being lazy. You know, one of the reasons why he reached out to me because I've been known to do the hard things. It's very easy to make another shoe that doesn't actually move the needle or is safe, but I've been known for. Uh, much like him being controversial in the designs that I've created, controversial in the process of creating those designs. And that's part of some discomfort is good, especially from the marketing people and brand people. I'm like, ooh, I don't know. I'm scared of that. I'm like, perfect. Then I'm doing the right thing because I should scare you. And so it's, it's you know, it's it's a lot like Ye's public persona, no filter. And why why be held back? There's plenty of people to do the easy things. There's a handful of us that do the hard things. Stephen, what's the scariest shoe you made? Oh, I don't know. You know, I mean, the Fury, the, the Reebok Fury scared a lot of people. You know, it's still, that's what's so cool about it is it's very futuristic even today, even though it's going to be 35 years old. And it's pretty nuts when you think about it, you know? Yeah, that's insane. It's 35. I did not know it was that old. Wow. Yeah, I, I first drew it in like 91, thereabouts. So it's getting close. Yeah, I don't know. That one scared a lot of people, especially within Reebok. They didn't know what to do until firemen yelled at them. Even the Wave Runners scared a lot of people because the business and the market was very 350, simplistic, one piece knitted, and all of a sudden this thing comes out with 35 parts on it and um it's it was a futuristic throwback i guess is the way i don't, I don't want to say retro futurism because that's not right it was a futuristic throwback the thing that was cool about it and the thing that's cool about a lot of the designs that we do together he and i is that we never set to create this these iconic products but they just naturally happen that way i mean much like the when he creates music, it's it's like an instant hit or instant classic. And the Wave Runner in particular, you look at that one, the 700, you can't tell when it's from. You know, it's got a 80s, 90s vibe, but is it? It could have been made yesterday. It could have been made today. It could be made tomorrow. You don't know where it's from. It was instant. And you look at it and you're almost like, it's always been there. Of course. Of course, it's always been there. And when we create the product, it's it's we're creating this accessible art for the kids. And that's what's cool. You know, it's it's not sometimes people think, oh, you only made so many, but it, it's it's part of it is a limited edition. But then you make the limited edition of each color versus the one style. Um, and you end up making a, a, a lot of them. 
but it's different colors then become the limited collector thing. Um, and I like to wear them all, to be honest. You know, I mean, their shoes, at the end of the day, you should use them. We made them comfortable so that you'd wear them. But again, a lot of, at the end of the day, it's, it's for, for a lot of these kids, you know, not everybody can afford a Warhol or a Mona Lisa. And so it gives them that little piece of, of art to collect and display and uh, cherish. And that's the designs are art pieces. If you look at the language, it's not like in your face, like, oh, yeah, look, this is this is obviously a Yeezy shoe when you look at it, because we took down the other style and we just kind of changed the other style a little bit. So it's all family. Some of the styles that we've done are very different from each other but that art piece that he and i together and, and add to it there's a strand of yeezy dna that he instills in it where you immediately look at it and like oh yeah that's a yeezy you know because the slide is very different than the wave runner than the 500 than the 450 the 350 they're all very different but you look at them immediately and you know of course it's a yeezy and if you see anything that looks even remotely like it, you're like, oh, yeah, look, somebody ripped off the Yeezys. <laughs> you know what I mean? They never say, oh, look at that. As an individual item, they're like, oh, that's a ripoff of the Yeezy because of that aesthetic that we created in this strand of DNA that interconnects it all, whether it's the color palette, the materializations. You look, there's no branding. There's no logo. We don't have to rely on that. I mean, a lot of times Nike will, or in Adidas, they'll, they'll rely on the three stripes or the, the swoosh, you know, like. You have to see the swoosh to know that it's a Nike. If you took the swoosh off, what would it be? And basically, we we create it without branding, without a logo. It doesn't need it. It's a crutch. What's your thoughts on, you know, comfort versus design versus the, you know, how good the shoe is? Because I was just thinking of the Nike, their, their runners, the one that all their marathon runners use, and it has, like, crazy tech in it. What's your thoughts on those three different aspects? I guess tech design and comfort i think what we've done and what he's done in particular was smash down those walls of classification you know what are they for you look at the 350 what's it for is it for running maybe is it for basketball mm, wouldn't be the best but you could ball in it play tennis in it maybe you can chill out in it walk around you know it doesn't have to be categorized or put in a box and, um, you know, I mean, if, say like the wave runner, yeah, we call it the runner. It's, you know, inspired by and you could run in it. I and mean, that's what one of the reasons why he brought me in. So like I inherently build in the performance aspect into it, but it's still fashionable and cool and interesting looking. So I think it's it's very hard. And and that's where a lot of these companies can't replicate what we do because they, they 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 have this innate uh desire to classify to box to constrain and that's we we reject that like the foam runner in theory you could go run in it would i i don't know you know but you can run for the bus and it looks really cool and it, and it's simple uh they float you can use them as a beach shoe again what is it what box does it fall and it doesn't and i think that's a, a, a it, it's a very hard thing for companies to achieve or um, to understand how we're able to do things like that because everything's segmented and recipied and we smashed it all down and created a new thing. And I think that's, you know, again, part of that's that agent provocateur um, question everything kind of mentality that allows us to do these products that nobody else can I mean, and they're comfortable. You know, one of the things when I first started with him, he said to me, Yeezy makes life easy. So that's kind of what we do. You know, some of the shoes are slip-ons because you just want to jump in them and go. Um, they're all comfortable. Uh, ultimate, that's the ultimate goal. I mean, make them as comfortable as possible. Are there any brands that you sort of have your eye on, whether it's like Levon's or Axel Arigato's, any sort of obscure brands that sort of, pique your interest, Stephen? For me, mm, I don't know. It's rather interesting because you could see where, you know, part of what we did is we kind of broke a lot of the rules and we were the point of the spear as far as driving the business. And with us going quiet right now, 
it, it doesn't seem like there's enough of a push or innovation and in things. I mean, I see some brands coming up strong. So like on, I think the kids are looking for something different. I mean, it might even give a chance for a, an anter or a leaning to, to creep up with something cool. They're, they're definitely trying different things and they're getting better and better looking. So it's, it's hard to say there's so many, that's the thing with the internet and globalization. There's so many brands that everybody has to access to, but there's still only a handful of us that are the leaders of, of what we're doing. I mean, New Balance is definitely strong coming back from Italy, that 550 basketball shoe that I did in 88, 89. I mean, 50% of the people I saw were wearing the 550. It was crazy. I mean, it, it's mind blowing to, for me to see it like, holy crap, you know. I wish I got a piece of them, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but it's fun. It's fun to see, you know, cause in some ways they're like your children and you're like, Oh, you've grown up and you're doing well on your own without me. Excellent. You know, or they bring them back and they're one of the few brands that, um, uh, that I worked for in the past who actually are very friendly and reach out. And, uh, Sam Pierce who works there on a lot of the retro product always reaches out to me and asks me like, did we get it right? Is this correct? Did you have any of the drawings that we could work from? So we get it as accurate as possible. Um, so that's kind of refreshing. You know, there's, there's others like the, um, the spectrum that I did at Nike that Supreme picked up, you know, Nike never asked me about it. Uh, they, um, they didn't even acknowledge that I had anything to do with it. The industry knew where it came from. You know, they kind of erase you once you're out the door. Uh, and at least New Balance and Reebok have been very good about celebrating the history of where these things came from because they were done by people, you know, and uh, whether whether they liked me or not, they can't take it away from me because I did I, I created these things. So that that's kind of fun. It's fun to see the brands that you had worked for um, being successful. And if it's part of my old work, so be it. That's even better. Uh, I always said it means I did the right thing. So yeah, it's kind of it's kind of hard to pinpoint specific brands, but there's definitely you know there's definitely interesting brands out there popping up here and there. It's interesting how we're slowly moving towards an age where we're sort of recognizing the creator versus the studio or the company or the brand. Like for example, we reference. Christopher Nolan movies as this is a Nolan movie like that is very rare and he's probably one of the few that we can sort of do that with then when it comes to designs we're starting to mention you know yay that's a yay design that's a um, Jerry Lorenzo design versus you know that is Nike that is Adidas and, and you're right slowly people are starting to know okay this is a you know Stephen Smith design but Back in the days, it would just fall under Reebok, New Balance or Nike, and the creator would be just forgotten. Well, I think a lot of the times you look at it now is the information age. You can pick it up, like who designed this? And you can find it. Whereas back in those days, um, the industry was much smaller, but it was much more competitive for poaching people, which is why earlier in my career, I... I left New Balance to go to Adi and then left Adi to go to Reebok was they kept you quiet. They didn't want you exposed because all of a sudden, like, holy shit, that's the guy who did that shoot. We should get him. You know, and they come with the headhunters trying to trying to track you down and offering you crazy positions. And there was a lot of times where I said no to a lot of lucrative deals and it because I, I you know, I liked what I was doing. So yeah, in those days, the companies kept you very quiet or they handpicked somebody to be the face. That's the only person we're going to talk about, even though there were 10 other people behind them. I mean, in New Balance, it was just me and this other guy, Kevin Brown. So it was just the two of us uh, designing everything back then in the 80s. But even then, it's like it was about New Balance. It wasn't about us. I mean, I think once the sneakerheads and huge fans started to get involved they started to do their research on who did this where did it come from why does it exist and we became you know interesting to them which is cool because in in the past it just it was, it was a faceless role and like i always say in those early days it was a handful of us doing this and it was people like myself and tinker and bruce kilgore and uh, wilson smith and we, we made it interesting 
we made it cool uh, as a job. So now all these kids are interested. They want to do it. They all reach out. Oh, how can I do it? Show me my sketches. Show this. Let me send you this. Let me send you that. So it's kind of fun because when I when I got my first job at New Balance out of design school, the other students I went to school with were like, they almost like laughed at me like, are you going to do sneakers? Ha ha ha. You know, we're going to do computers or medical devices. I was like, I don't know. It could be kind of fun. It's fun. And I ran. So it, I could, uh, to me, it was cool. I get to design something for, for me, not that personal in the design that you're always designing for yourself, but something that I can use. Because a lot of the times when we were in those early days of computers, you're designing these massive workstations that went into laboratories and things and medical devices that 12 surgeons in the whole world would ever use. And your design wasn't accessible. And so with me, when I did the sneakers at New Balance, you know, 100,000, 200,000 people could have see and appreciate my designs. And now after all these years, it's millions, millions of people can appreciate my designs, which is cool. You know, it's very rewarding, like to walk through a city or an airport and, oh, look, there's a 574, there's a 550, you know, and you want to go up and thank every one of them. Thank you for appreciating my design. Um, and it's, it's humbling. And I think, that, you know, it's uh it's it's interesting it's been it's been fun how has the yeezy design looked like before and after you oh you know if you think about it it was the 750 the 350 v1 350 v2 i think the 350 v2 kind of opened the door for something different and then when i when i started with them a lot of the times in the corporate world, you get a brief and then you do four sketches and you narrow the four down to two. You go to a bunch of committees, a bunch of people go, mm, yeah, mm, yeah, mm, I don't know. And then you get the one and then you sit there and develop the one. Um, and I think that's how the previous people had presented art to him where when I would show up, I'd have 25 sketches. They'd be like, whoa, what's all this? You know, I only saw three last time. I'm like, wow, well, you want more? Here is 50. And um, it was it was great for him because he was creative, you know, he, he was uh, creatively insatiable. And I've always been considered creatively explosive. So we have this perfect match where I had this idea and then that spurs me to do like 20 ideas from that. And then he sees five and then all of a sudden there's 50 and it just keeps growing exponentially. And it takes us to all new places rather than, you know, we're expanding rather than contracting and retracting and shrinking the opportunities. This way you're expanding the opportunities and coming up with multiple options and multiple paths and multiple solutions. And it's, it's very different than you would normally get in the rest of the world. So to him, it was an eye opener of let's just dream and build it. And so that's what we do. What's your thoughts on the Nike? I don't know, is it the hyper runners? What's the one that the new one that the marathoners use and it sort of has that metal thing in the between because it looks pretty cool and it's very sort of, it, it actually helps you run faster. They, they found a good balance with that shoe. Yeah, it's kind of kind of funny. You know, you think back when we were doing all the carbon plates and things back at Reebok, we did a lot of experimentation with that. I mean, a Nike package it is cool. It's if you think about it, they they put a spring plate on top of essentially a Hoka geometry tooling, um, and then streamlined it. And so it's it, it's interesting. I think with a lot of those uh, very niche performance product like that. Yeah, it made some Kenyans run a little bit faster, but can it really apply to the everyday? Like, could you go out and run in it and be comfortable? Maybe not. I mean, people always ask me like, oh, do you take your race car on the street? I'm like, hell no, it's horrible. You know, because public roads aren't good. It's not meant for that. It's meant on a controlled surface within a racetrack to do what it needs to do. You can't go 120 on the street without getting arrested. It's not fun to drive a race car slow. So it, it, I, I look at it in a, in a similar fashion to some of these, these high performance destination product like that. Yeah, it's cool, but is it the most comfortable thing? Is it the right thing for, the, for everybody? And I mean, that's the thing we try to do is make the best product for everybody rather than making the best product for a handful of 
um, elite athletes. So, I mean, and, and it's good. It needs to be done. I mean, like when I was at Nike, I did a lot of the Olympic track and field, very niche, very small focus group of people for it, but you wouldn't wear them on the street. Um, but they got gold medals. Paula Radcliffe broke the world record in marathoning and this pair of shoes. I mean, the irony is that it did become the the spectrum <laughs> that Stussy picked up. I mean, I'm um, sorry, Supreme picked up. Stussy did the spirit on the spirit on was meant for a very niche Japanese marathon runner, you know, same kind of thing. And uh, yeah, very different. So it's a different perspective on it. Whereas we, they have to take some of the performance styles and make them lifestyle or people rediscover them and make them into lifestyle shoes. Whereas we're just this hybridization that's not understandable of all of it. <laughs> Do you guys, when designing, take into account people with flat foot, people with arch foot, because as you were talking about those hyper runners, like since I have flat foot, I could just imagine the size just sinking in and me walking every day would not be comfortable at all with flat foot. Yeah, I mean, again, you want to you want to make it for everybody. And that all starts with the last, as I always say, as a joke in the footwear business, the last comes first. And if you make a universal enough last, it'll fit, you know, 80 percent of the people. There are people with high arches that maybe it doesn't fit the greatest but it fits okay um, and then you integrate the comfort into the rest of the shoe whether it's through the how the upper fits or the soft plush materials the in, in the adidas case we use the boost foam all of those things accommodate multiple shapes and multiple needs of feet i mean footwear in general is very hard because you can be you know an elite marathoner wear size as nine, you weigh 130 pounds. Like when I started at New Balance, I, I ran every day. I weighed 139 pounds. I was a size nine. Ed Norton, who was the VP of R&D, he was like six foot three, climbed mountains, but could still wear a size nine. And he was about 210. You know, so all of a sudden the shoe needs to serve me at 139, him at 210. And it it's it's very different. I mean, you can you can get some people who are a little overweight, maybe they're like 300 pounds, wearing a size nine. And then here's a Kenyan who weighs 110 pounds, who's a size nine. <laughs> you know, it has to, the, the product has to work for both. So it's very, it's, 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 it's a challenge sometimes. So I think you make it as accommodating as you possibly can and the fit, the shape of the last and everything else. Does that make sense? It does. Is it possible like to create like a, I have a memory foam bed where like I sleep and it sort of molds to my back and body. Like as you're talking about that, like could you create like a memory foam sole that pops up for people with arches and it's flat for people with flat foot? Like what type of innovation have you guys thought of? Some of the sock liners, you know, the, in, the insoles, they have memory foam in them. The hardest thing is like what you're saying. So in, in your sleep, you're static, right? So you're sinking into it almost like a sarcophagus, right? Whereas when you're under motion with your foot, you're doing thing, you know, it needs to be comfortable when you put your foot in a store, but then it also needs to be comfortable when you're dynamic as far as heel strike and roll off. And, you know, when, when we were at Reebok and Nike, um, we had a lot of very smart people trying to create real computer simulations of your foot. And it's, it's very difficult because what your foot is doing is under gate, you land on your heels. So it's impact on a bone and that forces go straight up through the rest of your leg bones up into your hip, into your whole body, right? And then you're rolling through gait, through your midfoot. And then as you get to your forefoot and your toes, your foot now becomes a shock absorber. And so the bones in your foot spread out, right? So it redistributes the force. So your foot, I mean, if you, you, when I explain this to you, you'll think about it now. You come down hard, it's rigid. Your foot becomes very loose to absorb the impact and also adapt to any surface that you're on, right? And then when it comes to toe off, when you go to propel again, it goes rigid, soft, loosey-goosey, back to rigid to be a lever to propel you forward. It's very hard to simulate that because there's so many forces and so many dynamic changes going on between your bones, muscles, and tendons from this thing of being a, a shock absorber to a, 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 you know, 
a, a forward projecting lever. I love how technical you are. And I guess it's just a compliment to like your years of experience in the space and really being passionate about shoes. Yeah. I mean, I've always had this open mind of if you're going to make it better, you need to understand it, what's happening to it. Just drawing a picture doesn't get you into it. Uh, understanding the engineering behind it, relating to the engineers, because you need them at the end of the day, you know, in the process, you need these engineers and they're, they're worried about black and white. I live in gray, you know, as, as the artist side is in gray, but I like to put a foot into black and white so I can help explain it to them because I need them to execute the vision that I have for the product. I want it to be the best I can. And it's all language and communication. And if I don't communicate in the language that they understand, it's a miscommunication, right? It's like, you know, speaking Swahili and expecting someone who can only speak English to understand it. You want to have a rudimentary understanding of English so that you can communicate to the best of your abilities this product. What's your thoughts on Ugg boots? Ugg boots are sort of warm, they're quite versatile, you can wear them indoors, outdoors. They sort of look coolish um, and they're, they're in line with these furs and they're quite, it has this one shape sort of fits all. Obviously there's different sizes. What's your thoughts on Ugg boots? I, I like, you know, I don't own any, but I think they're kind of fun. You know, you can jump in them and go. Um, the fact that the originals were sheepskin, they don't stink with sweat like a polyester, a synthetic material for the lining. That's why if you buy cheap knockoff Uggs, they usually have a polyester fake fur inside and then your feet stink. You know, part of that, that, and, and, and I think that's one of the cool things about it is that natural environmental side of it where it's a hide, it's a, you know, it's a byproduct of, of nature uh, versus a plastic that's a byproduct of a laboratory. Um, I, I, like I said, I don't wear them, but I like them. I think they're cool. It's a nice solution. It's simple. You know, this is the thing, like when you think about the performance side of things, when you're dealing with these elite athletes, they're say a uh, marathon runner, a sprinter, right? Soccer player. They want to think about the game. They want to think about the marathon. They want to think about getting their best time. The last thing you want them worrying about is their shoes or thinking about it. They should put them on and they should forget they have them on and it should help them achieve their goals. That's one of the cool things. I mean, if you think of the UGG, it's the same kind of thing where you put it on, you don't think about it. It's so it, it, of course it works. Um, and I, I guess that's the way to look at it. Similar to like a 350, the 350 works. It's a slipper uh, with a kind of a cool runnery type of bottom, but it, damn, it's comfortable when you put it on, you can slip it on. You don't necessarily have to lace it. You don't think about it again. Other than if it's so comfortable, you're like, damn, these things are comfortable. That's all I can think of. As opposed to, holy crap, these things suck. My feet are killing me, <laughs> you know, or I'm not going to, I'm not going to, you know, if you look back at the athlete's perspective, I could have ran better if it wasn't for these damn shoes hurting. So I think you have to look at it in, in, in that way. It's like, you don't want it to be a reason. You know, I, I always looked at it like, so the Olympics, right? I'm doing the track and field shoes for the for the Olympic athlete. These poor guys, girls, four years. If you fuck up their chances that one time in four years because you made them a bad shoe, I, I, I don't know how you'd live with it. It would eat at me forever. So give them their best because they, they got to wait four more years if they screw up at the Olympics. So I've always had that point of view to the product when it came to the performance side of it. It needed to deliver. It needed to deliver the best the best performance possible. And so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a different way of thinking about it, but the comfort is exactly the same as the performance side of it. You want them thinking about what they're doing, not about what that thing's not doing for them. It's crazy how versatile you are, Stephen, sort of working on performance shoes for Olympians and then sort of being, you know, creating crazy designs such as the Fury Pumps. Well, the, you know, the, the Fury started as a performance running shoe. It was going to be the, the lightest weight running shoe possible. We got it at that time, which it was at like nine ounces. Putting in the carbon fiber arch and separating the forefoot and the heel took out a third of the midsole. So that cut out a third of the weight of the bottom unit, right? Um, using the pump, 
the whole shoe was 25 component 25 components to make it if you took any one of them off it would no longer work purely performance very Bauhaus in its thinking it was built for gait you know the arch the carbon fiber piece supported your arch the forefoot was able to move independently the heel with the hexalite in it was cushioning an impact much like with the gait what we do with the traditional shoes, you put pack a bunch of foam in there and then laces so you can adjust it infinitely to fit all the different widths and girths of say, a, you know, a size nine. So what we did is um, made the pump do all of that. So there's no laces. So you take out all that crap, all the extra stuff that forced you to make a mediocre product that adjusted to people's feet just through the foam or up tightening or loosening the laces, the pump did it all. And so by taking away all those extra components, then it allowed you to put the profit that you had into the, all those extra, you know, pieces that were pennies, you add up like 35 of those 10 cent pieces. Now you got 350 that you're putting crap in and you can put that 350 into a much more technical material, say like the carbon fiber arch piece or the pump bladders. Um, it's, it's, uh, creating a cool technical solution and at an affordable price by being clever about how you designed it. Thinking back to all the different shoes I've had, like I remember like five, six, seven, eight years ago when the Ultra Boost came out, that was, it felt like a game changer. It was new, you put on the shoes and you're like, wow, this is really freaking comfortable. I remember the first time I tried an Ultra Boost, I was like, whoa, this is, it feels like I'm walking on clouds. And then strangely now thinking about it, I don't see many Ultra Boosts around anymore. And then thinking before that, I remember back then there was like Asics with the gel. They used to have the shoes with the gel and that felt really comfortable. And you don't see that around anymore. But it did feel like the, the Ultra Boost was a, a jump in sort of innovation and technology. And I guess it's, maybe I'm wrong, but it feels like it's faded away. But what's your whole thoughts on sort of new tech, it ramping up and being the thing and it sort of disappearing. I think they take you to different plateaus within the business of comfort that it reset what comfort is. And so once you reach a plateau like that, it then forces others to react and respond. So Nike came out with softer air, bigger, bigger air um, on, on comes out with their hollow cushioning systems. So it forces them to step up to your level. So now everybody's at this parity again. And so now it takes somebody else to take that leap to push it even further from there. So we'll see where it goes. You know, um, there's a lot of interesting foam solutions. Sometimes the materials, there's uh, a refocus or a, almost like a distraction that, okay, we made, we all made the best comfort we could at that moment in time. Now let's focus on the sustainability. So rather than taking the leaps in comfort, you go sideways on, oh, this piece is recyclable or this uses an eco foam. And so now you're over here again, and then all of a sudden somebody else will come out with some next comfort level technology. And all of a sudden you got to jump to that leap again and, and create parity again. And it pushes, it, it keeps pushing things. Uh, it all becomes what the messaging is. And it's almost like when you throw a piece of bread down in the park and all the pigeons are jumping on it. All the pigeons jumped on cushioning. And so they made something almost quite as good as the boost. So now you didn't notice it as being as special as it was that first time you did. I mean, Hoka, right? Hoka, you got these big double thick midsoles. People are like, oh my God, they're so soft and cushiony because it's got this giant thing, a sponge in it. So now everybody makes that height of midsole. So now everybody's at a parody with Hoka, right? So what's going to be, so like your Hoka is your successor to what you felt with the Ultra Boost, right? Because mm -hmm. they're, oh, this is so comfortable. Okay, well, the boost maybe isn't so comfortable now in comparison to this big foam. So that took the leap. And so the next the next thing will be whatever's after Hoka. You know, maybe it's like ultra, ultra boost where it's boost like two inches thick. Who knows? It, it's, it's, I guess you have to look at what, where the innovations come from and where the focus comes from. Because like, whew, everybody's like, whew, all right, we made all made a comfortable shoe like the ultra boost. Now what? <laughs> uh, we all make comfortable shoes. So why would we make something else more comfortable until somebody else is tinkering in a lab and this new foam and material comes out and it's that much better. And then it forces everybody else to, to advance the whole industry that way, much like knitted uppers, you know, knitted uppers. Everything was like, 
leathers and overlays and layers and this piece of breathable mesh and then all this other stuff on it. And I stripped it all away and it, it was knitted like a sock. Everybody was after a sock. So everybody did knitted uppers. Now everybody has a knitted upper. So what's the next level? What's the next answer? Stephen, what's your thoughts on, you know, the cycle of fashion? Because, you know, it's weird how things keep coming back and it sort of loops. And then you have this sort of option to either design something that's current for the time, design something that's like 10 years into the future, and it will be current for 10 years in the future, or create something that's quite standard and will probably keep coming back over these cycles, whether it's like the volleys or, you know, the, the 350 New Balances or the um, Nike Cortezas. Um. I mean, I think where the fashion world crosses it, I mean, there's definitely people pushing the envelopes of what is a shoe, what is shape, what is form, what are materials, like the big red boot thing. That's very funny, you know, <laughs> uh, they're doing that, you know, mischiefs doing their own variations and spins on it. Part of that came from those big, silly lager boots that Ye wore that were the Balenciaga ones. Um uh, so there's some tongue in cheek humor in it that gets interjected from from the fashion world. But if you think of what we did um, before when you were doing the colors and trend and stuff, you hooked it up to your apparel. So if you were going to wear you building a running shoe, it, it, it connected to your track and field line or your running sweats and that's it now so like people always ask me like oh what do you think about these nine million collabs and colors on your insta pump fury and it's like i think it's great it keeps them alive it keeps them fresh i never imagined some of the colors and patterns that people have used on them you know um the the vitamins ones amazing reinterpretations of or applicate you know application of a of a graphic to what i created as this um this canvas for them to apply their palette to is it's interesting. It's fun. Like I never imagined it ever being a fashion shoe yet. Here it is. It keeps it alive. It keeps it interesting. It keeps it fresh. So I think the fashion world brings that into it. Materials, even some of the materials from, from runway find their way into some of these shoes. I mean, whoever thought uh, there'd be a Margiela version of the fury, you know? So <laughs> there it is. There it is on the runway. Uh, with big massive heels and um, tabby toes and things like that that I never envisioned it evolving into so it's kind of fun it's fun to see people play with your original design do you ever look at different type of sort of shoes like slippers gum boots hiking boots female sort of heels and look at all these completely different type of sort of footwear and sort of just think about it yeah, I mean, we're always looking at everything. I mean, that's the thing about being a good designer is having your eyes open to everything that's going on. I mean, I remember when I did this track spike at Reebok called the MVO1, and it was kind of the first aerodynamically shrouded track spike. And then it showed up on Paris on runway models. It had to have killed their feet, but it was that was kind of the first one of those first times where i ever saw somebody taking something absolutely purely performance and wearing it in a fashion sense so they're looking at what we're doing and so that to me was like okay i should look at what they're doing so maybe some of this language and um commonalities can understand each other and then you know even on the the factory side of things you can learn different construction details and things from some of the the heels how they're made how they get materials to take a certain shape or form i i find all of that stuff fascinating and again you know what what we do now doesn't necessarily have to be tied into sport and connecting it needs to tie into fashion at some point so that people can wear you know get it hooked up to other brands and other aesthetics and other uh, areas of, of fashion than what we originally imagined it to be I love how involved you are with like the numbers, you sort of know the FOB, the profit margins, then you also want to go to the warehouse and talk to the manufacturers and talk to the engineers and then figure out, talk to the professionals, whether it's athletes or people in fashion, and you're involved in the whole sort of process, like the whole vertical sort of process of a shoe. 
I have always looked at it, and I think it was inherent, maybe from my mom being a school teacher. You should learn something new every day. And information's great. Um, why not get as much as you can? And part of it is, so like, we're working on the 450, you know, with the fingers on it. You're dealing with some development people who didn't have as much experience as you did. And they were like, this can't be done. And I'm like, that's the that's the best thing you can ever say to me was it can't be done because now I'm going to show you how to do it and figure out how to do it. And because you've had this collection of knowledge, you can go, oh, well, this was made that way or this is almost like that. We can reapply this to that even down to specific machines to do a certain operation where they don't, they're not aware of it or haven't seen that in this particular factory. Inf information is, is key. It's a great tool. I've been blessed and cursed with this crazy photographic memory from my father. And uh, Ye has a very similar aspect to his mind in that you're collecting all of this information and you're retaining it all. And it's like a gigantic library in your head. And so it's very different than a lot of, you know, because I'll be talking to somebody. Well, you remember, we met this guy 10 years ago. He had on this outfit and they're like, I don't remember 10 minutes ago. And I'm like, I'm sorry, I forget that, you know, you forget that people aren't like you. And um, like I always tell people, I can remember exactly what I had on my first day of work almost 39 years ago at New Balance, what I wore, who I talked to, what I did. It's a strange thing because you you know, you think everybody else is like you, but then you realize they're not. You know, like, well, you know, remember we went here and we saw that and they're like, nope. And you're like, sorry. Well, let me tell you then, this is what we saw. This is what we did, who we talked to, you know. And um, I can remember seeing certain things in certain factories. And that was one of the cool things. If you think about like at Reebok, at the time, the footwear industry was very into the footwear industry. And when we were at Reebok, Paul Fireman gave us license to look outside. You know, a lot of the things that we did to evolve the pump came from the medical device or safety equipment, uh, instantly inflating life vests from a plane. Wow. The carbon fiber at the time wasn't in mass use. It was used in stealth fighters. It was used in Formula One car bodies, but that's about it. We reapplied it. We've got outside the footwear business, saw these other things. I got to meet the guys who worked on the SR-71 um, spy plane, and we reapplied the cool technologies they had there. We went to talk to 3M. They told us about these interesting new processes and materials. Uh, we were trying to create the ultimate traction devices for track spikes. So they hooked us up with their people who did stair tread tape and, and uh, traction structures for um, in your houses and things and, and industrial applications. So it was really cool because you got to be exposed to all of this different stuff rather than going to same old leather show and same old footwear equipment. Um, and you saw things like, well, I could get this to do that and I could reapply this and rescale it. And all of a sudden it's this technical innovation for footwear, which was really cool. Um, even some of the things that we did with Hexalite, like we ended up doing the platform that um, running treadmills were done underneath it that was 10 millimeter Hexalite. So that when rather than running on a rigid thing below your treadmill belt and heard, you know, not having cushioning, we put Hexalite under the treadmill belt so that when you ran on the treadmill, you actually got some return and some rebound and some cushioning to all of it. So it was even taking some of the things that we were doing in footwear and reapplying those to other things that Fireman was interested in. Like Paul Fireman, he bought Boston Whaler and they made boats. So we were working on this hydrol foam um, with DuPont that we didn't use in the footwear, but they ended up using it within the hull of the boats to keep the boats from, you know, one, one of the cool things about Boston Whaler is they were unsinkable boats. So this foam that we were creating for footwear, we ended up not using, but we gave it to Whaler and they used it as inside the linings inside the boat hulls. And then it also helped them to be unsinkable boats. So it's really interesting to cross pollinate with these we with these other businesses. And that's how you learn things. I never thought I'd be working on boats, but there we were. You know, we took this shoe thing and put it in a boat. Who who would have thought it? You know, we we were just lucky that Fireman was interested in boats. So he bought this boat company. So oh great, great, we get to work on boats. <laughs> you know. <laughs> it was fun. That's so cool. Like now I'm thinking of like 
bulletproof vests, sort of fireman, sort of fireproof gear. Now I'm thinking of like North Face Gore-Tex equipment, which is like waterproof clothing. And you've probably touched on all those different aspects of materials and technology and you're able to combine that experience and into your current work. Yeah, definitely. Um, there's some side projects that I've done with the military where some of the cushioning equipment and things that we had done with, with footwear and uh, impact absorption that we built into the linings within the striker attack vehicles. I ended up working on this football helmet for the company Shoot that ended up being the most um, concussion resistant football helmet in the business. And uh, so, yeah, it's kind of fun to do real, pro real world problem solving rather than just doing sneakers my whole career. I saw this sort of sort of bum bag, this sort of side bag that was made out of a material where if you poked a hole in it and then you just sort of scrubbed it, the hole sort of disappeared. It was like a, you could scratch it or like put a small pokes in it and then you rub it and then the hole would be gone. Yeah, it's definitely all in the weave. You know how tight or loose the weave is. If, the, if it opens up and does that, then you can kind of tighten the weave back up, stretch, pull it, and it closes back up. There's lots of, there's lots of cool solutions through materials. I mean, in the, in the early days that we did it, you know, we did it all, but now because the industry's grown so much, it created all these other opportunities for positions within these companies of like the color designer. And so you do the shoe in one or two colors that you intend it to be in. And then it goes to a color designer to do all those multiple, multiple colorways that keep dropping every six months. Um, same with materials. You, you build the original one or your materials person shows you this thing like, I found this material. What do you think we can do with it? And then your brain starts going and you come up with an application of it. So say something like that, where you're able to close the hole back up or repair itself. So it's nice to have all of these specialists feeding you ideas, you feeding them ideas. And again, it creates new opportunities for new positions for, for other people to have jobs, which I think is really cool. You know, that's a cool thing because in those early days, we had to do it all ourselves right down to CAD. You know, I did all the blueprint drawings by hand that then would go with pencil and paper. And then those would go, they would cut the molds from it. Now it's all CAD or 3D and it's 3D printed. I mean, things we could have only dreamed about back in those days. And yet we still create the same type of product, but with all these incredible technologies and resources uh, at our disposal. One of the things I used to stress about, you know, maybe one or two years ago was that you know, I would have editors, developers, copywriters, people to, who help with getting guests on my podcast. So I have all these people who are specifically doing this one task in my team. But then every day I could go through what they're doing. I could find something that they could do better at it. And all of a sudden my problems are multiplied by five, six, seven different sort of aspects of my business and in my mind I'm like you are just doing one thing you should be doing that one thing better than me spreading myself across seven things like I'm so angry that I'm catching these things and I have to juggle seven things and you can't get that one thing right <laughs> yeah we all do it I ended up with it with some of the developers were like why can't you fucking do it this way I can see it in my head here here's the machine here's how it's done um I don't know. It's hard. Sometimes you get ego. Sometimes you get personalities. Sometimes maybe it's our fault because we didn't communicate the goal. Yeah, it's hard. It's hard to explain. I mean, that's the that's part of the magic of working with people. <laughs> part of why I probably, you know, in the past, the old Stephen would be labeled as difficult to work with. Because I'm like, why the fuck can't you see it? I can see it. You know, it's in my head and I draw it. I'm like, look, this is how you do it. And they're like, God, he's such a pain in the ass. He's making me work hard. And, you know, like I said, it's it's easy to do the easy things. It's not easy to do the hard things. And I've prided myself on doing the hard things. Um, but those are the things that take you to a new place, that take you to those groundbreaking, the next levels of things. Um, if it was easy, everybody would do it. <laughs> You're like super chill and calm and sort of you have that sort of calm energy, but then you have you probably do know what works, what looks good. So you must be also critical when someone does something that you know for a fact doesn't look good. What's that been like? And also what's your conversation with Kanye, with Ye like? 
Do you guys ever have opposing ideas? And what does that look like? Oh, yeah. You know, because that was part of the magic when we first met each other was uh, he turned me on to all of these fashion people and other designers and artists that I hadn't heard of. So it was really interesting. So to me, you know, again, it's that more mind expanding of what um, I don't know about this. This is interesting. I'm going to learn something new. So we, we the, the, there's a few topics we're always like, I want this. And it's like, it, you, you can't do that just yet, you know, <laughs> but why not? <laughs> we'll do it. And I'm like, well, the infrastructure is not there. Well, let's build the infrastructure. And it's like, well, you know, you, yeah, but now you can't have it in two days. And it might take two years, but I want it in two days. And you're like, well, you know. <laughs> so you have to do your best, you know, at some point. But, you know, I always say, if you if you don't try, then you never know. And then you've already failed because you didn't try it. So why not try it? Risk failure, but the failure could also lead you to something different or another place that you weren't even thinking about. I mean, as much as I love Nikola Tesla more than Edison, Edison at least had, had a great quote is like, I've never failed. I've only found 10,000 ways not to do something. And I think you know, that's a good perspective to have on some of the product creation and questioning things like, what do you got to lose? You know, it might actually work. You know, you hear the old, that, that's a cliche in the movies. That's such a crazy idea. It just might work. And I think you have to look at it that way. Maybe it's not a crazy idea. Why don't you try it? I remember there was a podcast, maybe it was Yay on Joe Rogan, where he was talking about how he had a realization. It was like, you know, I don't want shoelaces. There's no need for shoelaces. And it yeah. sort of made sense. And then as I was writing that down, I was like, like, is it possible to create a shoe that fits all sizes? Like we don't need size US 5 to US 15. Have something that's like a sock that is sort of expandable and contraction. And you just have one one thing. Like there, no, there's no need for sizes. Um, Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Again, you know, like I said, there's no such thing as a bad idea. There's just those that work and those that don't. And part of it's a moment in time where the technology maybe doesn't exist, but it gives you a goal. I always explained it as the, when when, when we talked about innovation, we, we spent a lot of time thinking about it at Reebok and, and when we had our, our small team and, you know, in, innovations on a continuum, you're always trying to solve, there's universal problems you're always trying to solve. You work for a company, there's moments in time where things need to drop out of that continuum for the business, right? We need a new pump shoe. Okay. So you're working and working, 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 working. All right. The company needs a new pump shoe. You drop it out. It's 80% there, but then you go right back on the continuum to perfection. You can never get there, but it's the goal, you know, that, that chaotic quest of finding the end but there is really no end because all of a sudden new material pop up and that again kind of like where i was talking about the advancement of the cushioning and a, a, a new solution pops up so now that takes you further and further and further but there's common problems you're always trying to solve fit form function and now with fashion dropped into it they're endless goals right because people are different and um sizes are a, a different i mean that's the thing it's not just like you put a size nine in a copier and it blows it up it's like the foot changes across the x y and z axis it's very different as the shoe grows like the heels kind of stays roughly the same size maybe a five percent growth but the length is dramatic the width is you know that changes on a 10 to 15 percent percentage on the scale so it's hard to do that universal thing. And then you have different width, people with different width feet, um, even within, again, like a size nine. Uh, so it's very challenging to try and create these universal sizing and universal fit and universal comfort. What do you sort of mainly focus on, Stephen? Like when I sort of look at, so like Seinfeld, the, the comedian, every day he tries to write a joke. Do you sort of try to create a new unique design every day? Do you try to create and, and look at new materials every day? Do you look at sort of new ways to create comfort? Like 
or do you do all of that every day? Is, is there one thing that you focus on mainly that's your strength? I think there's all of it going on at once. It's just a higher percentage of what you're focused on for the particular project or what you want to explore. You know, what are you hung up on? Again, once the industry met that parity and cushioning, then it allowed people to explore sustainability. Then that gets you into materials that then that gets you into um, what those materials are made from the source material. Is it a bio material? Is it uh, something plant-based grown you know i was working on some bags that were made out of mulberry bush which is a weed in most parts of the world um, but we we're able to make it into a fiber so there's something natural that then you could make that the shoe could rot um, you could grow more it's sustainable because it's always there and you could make it anywhere in the world because mulberry grows anywhere so i think th all of those things and it allowed me to create a different form of bag so again, you know, all, all of those things are intertwined and, and work together. It's just percentages of where it falls in the pecking order of the priority of the project. Got it. So I can sort of see the, the vision now. So you have like, say, a bunch of cool designs and it's like, okay, how do I make it more environmentally friendly? Then you figure out the right materials. Okay, how do I go ahead and manufacture this? So now you focus on manufacturing and talking to engineers. Okay, now how can I do this in America? Okay, can I, how do I source this? And then it's just constantly growing. And I think, I guess, maybe when you get to the end, then you loop back to design. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I always say, keep the end in mind. What's the, what's the, what is the goal? And all of these things can distract you and detour you from the goal. But always remember, there's, you're going there and you mentally you're here and all these other things help you get there but so many other people can be distracted by the things along the way that then they lose their way to where they were originally going for that end in mind got it then what is your goal what is your there um yeah i don't know whatever the next thing he asked me to explore <laughs> what's your thoughts on sort of in this age and time being sort of vertically integrated where you sort of know a lot like your jack of all trades versus being a specialist being just focused on colors just focus on material i don't know i mean some people are happy doing that i like i like to do as much of things as i possibly can you know and sometimes you're like there are specialists he'll ask you to do something like why don't you do this piece of furniture and i'm like well you know there's people who special specialize in furniture design and uh -huh. it's kind of interesting because he's very empowering and he believes in you more than you believe in you and he'd be like you can do it and i'm like yeah i know i can but should i <laughs> so he's like you can do it and so you know he gives you the leeway to do it or explore it so it's kind of fun because like i said he believes in you more than you do sometimes so it's very empowering it's very freeing and liberating and you go explore why not what is it like working with yay on a personal level like what do you think people the, the side of him that people don't get to see he's a very genuine caring person um and he values fellow creatives above and beyond anything and so that's very refreshing yeah and you know he's on that same kind of learning and creative journey and wants to bring you along with it you know so i get to meet all kinds of cool people music industry people that i would never would have access to but it all adds up to sharing that dna of what easy is with him because he wants you to be the carrier of the brand and the message and and the aesthetic almost as an extension of him talking about furniture like there's brands like herman miller where they have the unique sort of herman miller chair there are a bunch of copycats and replicas they're not constantly racing and trying to figure out the next thing they've been able to sort of they have a small catalog they've been able to move at their own pace yet hold like a strong footing in the furniture space despite not having to race with a bunch of people copying their designs. What do you think Herman Miller has been able to do to be able to just hold their lane without having to sprint all the time? Yeah, it's very interesting. I mean, they come up with creative, solid solutions to things. And they've used famous designers in the past, like the Eames did a lot of work for Herman Miller. Saarinen, a lot of these people, 
famous designers did work for them. So I think it's 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 the same thing where you're you're you've always got that problem that end in mind and you're looking for solutions along the way. And like the Aeron chair, for example, that thing changed the industry because it was this breathable mesh that you were suspended on versus a big comfy cushion, you know, but it accomplished the same things. But now all of a sudden it was uh, cooling and breathable, which was something that wasn't in furniture before through a textile. When a company brings in a designer, for example, when Louis Vuitton brought in Virgil or currently brought in Pharrell, do those designers have an impact on the brand? Can they actually move the needle for Louis Vuitton? I think so because it's a fresh it's a fresh outlook, you know. I mean, it's it's very hard, you know. I, I remember being at some of the other companies, and they bring in people without telling you or letting you know they were going to bring them in, and you you kind of become disappointed in the company. Like, what? I'm here. I'm designing stuff for you. Why? What do you need them for? But um, as you've gotten older and understand it, or at least they tell you, like, oh, you know, what do you think about working with this person? Like, okay, let's give it a shot. Let's see what happens. It brings a different collection, you know, a different library in their head of what they think it is. And it gives a different perspective. And in some ways it's good. And I think, I think those brands keep it, keep it fresh that way. Yeah. There's different approaches to creativity and finding the new. Stephen, what do you think your sort of style is like coming from that space? Like what's your thoughts? Like do you sort of, what type of shoes would you be wearing? What type of clothing would you be wearing? Or are you sort of so in it that you don't really care? It's like a chef not really cooking for himself. Yeah, I mean, I think that's an important thing to understand is, you know, uh, I'm designing for teens and 20-somethings aesthetically. So I'm not that. I think it's a hard thing for some designers to rectify is you're not necessarily designing for yourself. You have to look at who it's for and understand them better. Because at the end of the day, we create objects of desire. That was one of the things at Reebok. There was a fundamental change in those days where we were competing against ourselves. We were competing against the Nike, the New Balance, the Adidas. And then came this thing called a Walkman, right? And it was in our price zone. So now all of a sudden, you're competing against Sony and you want that kid's $100, $150 and they can get this music player that played tapes that can take anywhere with them. And now all of a sudden you're just doing a dumb foot covering. And I think that's what escalated the technology and really moved the industry in the 90s was all of a sudden you had this different layer of competition, whether it was video games or uh, cell phones, um, music players, CD players, everything. Now all of a sudden you're competing with electronics and technology. So you had to make these shoes that were so cool or exciting that you could get that hundred dollars from that kid and it changed the game. And you could see where it was like the beginnings of, you know, moving beyond like a Cortez to full length air, you know, gizmotized amazing technology things that didn't even look like a sneaker anymore you know or a shoe as you knew it and i think that's that's the root of all of it so there was, there was a fundamental shift in, in in this object of desire that's an amazing thing that you caught like I, I never saw it in that light until you brought it up now Stephen. how you sort of understand this sort of economics of it like you're right like the moment a new technology comes out that 20-year-old is deciding if he should spend his $100 on the Walkman or a new pair of shoes, and you're most likely going to pick the Walkman. Yeah, that, that's a very interesting piece of knowledge that I haven't thought of, Stephen. Wow. Yeah, yeah. It changed, it changed the industry. How about clothing, Stephen? Do you work much with clothing? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've done some aspects of the clothes. I mean, when I was at Adidas, I worked on their wearable sport electronics, their soft circuitry embedded sensing equipment garments, which was really cool, integrating electronics with apparel. Um, that was very different, a new thing to work on. Um, myself, I live pretty simply. <laughs> some Dickies and a pair of jeans, it's all good. 
what's your thoughts on electronics and tech combined with like apparel or even shoes? Like the last time we've seen something like that was like the Nike self-lacing sort of back to the future shoes, but we haven't seen that much tech and shoes combined. Yeah, it's, it's again, it goes through cycles of gizmotizing, you know, I mean, was that meant for everybody? It was cool. Uh, was it accessible financially? Not really. And then, you know, as Nike got deeper into sustainability, now you've got all these things that have all these rare earth materials in it that don't go away with the batteries and the the magnets and things that drove it and the gears and things that aren't sustainable, that don't rot. So now all of a sudden it's a conflict for them. Uh, are we eco-conscious or are we tech? And so you know, one one gets louder than the other and the other thing quietly goes away. Uh, there was a whole thing with wearables, with all like night and all and self, self-opening self breathing apparel. And I mean, the I don't think the industry was ready for that. Some of those materials don't hold up to washing. There's the realities of garments. Um, you, you wash them every day. So how well would all that technology hold out? Can you separate it from it? Does the consumer want to be bothered with taking apart their shirt to watch it, wash it, to take this piece of electronics out and preserve it? Because that's where all the money is in the garment. You know, it's a t-shirt, it's a t-shirt, but all of a sudden you've got this $200 piece of electronics that needs to interface in it. So all of those things become factors in the success of these, you know, cool, interesting ideas. It's, there's, there, you know, there's a balance of cool, interesting affordability. And then at some point they... They reach each other and it becomes mass marketable. When you travel to, you know, Europe or Japan or go to places around the world with Ye, what are some interesting things that you've picked up or seen from these other cultures? I know Ye is a big fan of Japan. Yeah, I mean, I love Japan. It's my favorite place. Um, although Singapore was pretty damn cool. I had fun in Singapore. I think it's just being in that culture, the mindset how they behave. There's no better nerds than the Japanese for being embedded in, you know, once they go into something, they go deep. And so I think it's that, of that, that focus. Uh, again, Japan's my favorite. Um, Europe's fun. It's a different perspective. It's still the Western world. You can see a different, just a slight twist on things there, what's going on. It all, it all depends. Um, sometimes you'll see the strangest thing just sitting at home like what the hell is that and that'll trigger an idea Stephen, talking about home what's that cool wooden box that you have behind you with that crank towards your... oh that's a that's a 1916 edison phonograph so it's over 100 and what, 110 years old record player you know <laughs> and it has speakers and you put in like a like a big black disc and you wind it up yeah they're uh it's a big thick sheet of bake light and then it has acetate on it with the recording on it you put it in and you hand crank it and out of it comes the music through vibration and amplification no no electrical systems whatsoever in it that is so cool i, I remember there was like a phase where everyone was buying out those um those record players like the the portable ones the ones that you could put on your desk and those became vintage with the big sort of metal sort of sort of um i guess speaker yeah. horn that's what's inside of this cabinet is the big speaker horn in there it's all mechanical that is so cool tell me about the pottery you have in your shelf did you make that i've been really recently getting into pottery like i love the, the unique shapes and as well as the color palettes you've chose like i think my, my favorite color is the the, the one on the top shelf in the middle, that light blue. Um, oh, yeah. This is all Russell Wright furniture. I mean, uh, dishes from the mid-century by Steubenville Pottery. Russell Wright did these really beautiful organic forms in the 50s, kind of like a Noguchi table in, in, in how the shapes and forms were made. So we, we fell in love with it and started collecting a lot of it. That is so cool. So I, were they made in the 50s? Yeah, yeah. That is so cool. How does Ye find temporary workplaces? Like when you're working around the world, like is it just Airbnbs? Like I, I remember there was this photo of I think his apartment in maybe New York or something where 
it was like this room and in the middle there was this brick this sort of sort of cube that was sort of the, the bench in the middle of the living room and it was so simple like even his his place and i think i saw the youtube video maybe it was from vogue like he has it's so cool Yeah, it's very interesting. I mean, he just sometimes he just shows up, you know, like, hey, I'm taking over this place. And people are like, what's going on? What do you mean you're taking over this place? It's our office. And like, what's our office now? You know, it's, it's very funny. But he does definitely like to isolate himself in minimalism. I mean, if you look at the Donda, the creation of Donda, when he was at the Mercedes Benz Arena in, in Atlanta, it was a concrete room with a mattress and a pillow on the floor and that was it other than the recording equipment so um sometimes that's what he needs <laughs> he's been recently seen around in those socks those sock shoes and everyone's like well, yeah. and, and that's quite different like no one has been seen in public wearing like sock like shoes is that a is that like a new yeezy sort of shoe can't say <laughs> <laughs> Stephen, what do you carry around in your backpack? You say you sort of basically work from a backpack. What's usually your sort of everyday carries, your EDCs? Uh, yeah, everything's, everything's done on the iPad. <laughs> <laughs> That's always in the backpack. Uh, tape measure, a couple, couple Sharpies, a couple snacks. That's about it. <laughs> Oh, and my Sunday service necklace that he gave me, that's always in my backpack. One thing I haven't really gotten into is sort of like necklaces and bracelets, sort of jewelries. What's your thoughts on jewelry? And do you think it's sort of, we're moving towards a minimalistic sort of time where people aren't going to be wearing it as much? Or what's your thoughts on jewelry? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, he, he wears various things at moments in time. I personally don't. I mean, I just go with my classic watch and... So, you know, I guess, I guess I always think I'll get, get it caught on something on a piece of machinery. So I have as little on me as possible. How about shoes? What type of shoes? How about shoes? What type of shoes are you wearing, Stephen? I mean, I got some San Antonio SAS shoes and then I wear some Yeezys and wear, wear the New Balances because they're good about sending me my retro pairs when they come out with them. So I, I support, I support them. Basically, 574s, 550s, easy 700s, some 350s, pretty basic. Some uh, I got some retro Danner hiker boots that are really cool, made here in Portland. Do you have, like, where do you store all your shoes? Like, as, as a shoe designer, you must have, like, a ton. Do you have just a room filled with shoes? Uh, usually it's in storage boxes in the basement. I sold a lot at one point just because it's, it's it's overwhelming when you have hundreds of pairs and you've got to do something with them. So it's like at some point, you know, you got one pair of feet. So you pick and choose on what you're going to do. I mean, obviously the ones I've worked on, I've kept. So I have some for my portfolio. But um, yeah. Do you um, wear prototypes that you make? Is that something you test quite often? Yes, all the time so that you can judge did I get to the goal? Are they comfortable? Will they hold up? Always. That was one of the things we started with at New Balance. Um, it seemed like 90% of us were a size nine, which was sample size. So we could all wear the different prototypes every day. We'd pass them around. Everybody had run in them every other day. You'd swap out. And I think that's what made the product better. And it also shaped how I think about the product and making the best thing possible because that's what we always tried to do. How about thrifting? Do you thrift often? Do you sort of go in thrift stores, see, just get inspiration or buy things personally? Yeah, I've got lots of crap around here. <laughs> stuff, 70s stuff, 30s stuff. Sometimes it's bad. You end up with a lot of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Another question I had, what's your thoughts on you know inspiration, design, coming up with new things? Like, do you believe in the news and it being something that, you know, if you listen, like, how do you come up with new sort of innovative things? I don't know. I think it's immersing yourself in different environments. I mean, that's, what's been cool about with Ye, where he plunked us in the middle of Wyoming with nothing. And so you were in, again, you're inspired by the colors and materials you were surrounded by there. If you couldn't get it at Walmart, you couldn't get it. And that's all that was there was one Walmart store and a, and a Western supply store. 
so some of those things then influence what you did you know maybe that's part of that was why the inspiration for a lot of the boots because you were on the ranch so you wore ranch boots what's our interpretation of a futuristic ranch boot what would you wear you know in the year 3000 if you were operating a ranch and so some of those things become inspiration of of what we do it puts you out of context to create the next context Stephen, uh, you know the photos we've been standing back and forth you're always in sneakers if you're going to like an opera concert what type of shoes would you be wearing uh it depends on where it is if it's, if it's sitting down i don't care too much but if it's a show where you're going to be standing up you want something comfortable 350s 700s <laughs> if it's outside you don't want to take your nice white based 700s you want a dark one because they're going to get dirty <laughs> last question steve what's your thoughts on the future of design where do you think we're pushing towards i mean i think we've been trending you know there's been a lot of technology people talk about ai but without the human interaction there'd be no archive for ai to pick from to create these mishmashes of things that were created by people at the end of the day it's about people and i think as we look at design it's it's more personal, it's more crafted, it's more human scale versus um, mechanized, automated, pure futuristic sci-fi. I mean, there's two different camps of sci-fi, you know, there's RoboCop and then there's like Star Wars. You know, if you look at what they were wearing on Tatooine, it's very Bedouin, uh, simplistic, hunter-gatherer type materials. So I think that's, I think that's one of the perspectives to look at it, what's available what's out there, using up resources wisely. And it's almost like that hunter-gatherer type of vibe. And again, simplified. People don't want to have to think about it. They want to wear what's comfortable. So I think that's that's one of the real opportunities of the future. I love that. Stephen, where can our audience learn more about you, follow you on, on your journey? Anything that they can do to sort of keep in touch and follow you? I mean, I, the only social media I'm really on anymore is Instagram, um, some LinkedIn, but I don't, I don't do too much on it. Uh, you can Google a lot. There's been a lot of good articles written about me. I, I was, it was funny. I, I met one of my heroes was this guy, Bob Gurr, and he's like the last living Imagineer that helped Walt Disney create all of the rides in the park and, and uh super cool guy. He's like 91 years old and we were, we were walking around and somebody asked like, oh, Bob, where can I see more of your work? And he stopped. He went, Google me. <laughs> so it was very funny. I always remember that. I'm like, I want to get to a point where I can say that. So I think I'm at that point now where you can, you'll Google me and you'll, you'll find info there on the various uh, articles and websites that have done stuff on me. But, you know, Instagram's a good one to follow the things. I, I really post things on there that interest me. And then the 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 footwear stuff and apparel stuff and whatever a lot of a lot of car stuff you'll see a lot of car stuff and various design things so i think that's that's kind of the best one and it's just stephen smith stephen smith we'll link it in the description below man this was such a fun conversation stephen i love how passionate you are about sort of the design space i can feel the wealth of the knowledge like you've been doing this you're like a purebred sort of like designer you've been in the weeds you've done all the different you know vertical sort of process you know everything from like the making of the materials all the way to making of the shoe and then the economics of it like the, we've hit so many different topics and you just have such a huge wealth of experience i'm really really blessed to have you on today and on top of that you're so open and humble and you have this growth mindset even at this stage of your life where you're still sort of you have that hunger to learn more, meet new people and, and see different aspects of life. And that's sort of the takeaways I got from this sort of conversation with you. So thank you. Yeah, it's, it's, it's fun. Keep it fun. If it's not fun, then it's work and you don't want to do that. I agree. So guys, if you made it this far into the episode, thank you so much for your time. Hope you guys got some value. I had so much fun and I'll see you guys next week with another episode. Peace.